All right. Well, Chad, Chad, thank you so much for joining us. We've, this conversation has been in the works for a long time and we're so excited to finally have you here to talk about this uh, conflict. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm excited to be here and uh, a big fan of of Faith Matters and the podcast. So it's it's fun to be in conversation with you after listening to so many of your podcasts with a lot of oh. people I respect. Oh, oh thanks, thank Jeff. you. I would love to just start with a little bit of background on you. Could you just tell us a little bit about your involvement in mediating conflict generally in the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, it actually it actually starts as a undergraduate student at BYU Hawaii. Uh, and uh, I was in this very diverse campus. I I absolutely loved it. I, I went here just because uh, where where I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, there was a lot of Pacific Islanders uh, that lived there mm-hmm. uh, and they were all LDS and, and they were sort of who introduced me uh, to the church. So after a semester at BYU and then a mission. Uh, and I ended up serving in a Tongan ward and a Samoan ward in, in California. I was like, eh, th- you know, these are my people. This is where I, I really want to be. But uh, Neil A. Maxwell came out to campus one time and started talking about the the why behind BYU Hawaii, why it was in Laie, David O. McKay's, uh, you know, trip in 1921, where he had this vision after seeing this sort of destruction that it happened throughout the world in World War One. David O. McKay like traveled around the world as as the youngest apostle, and this growing sense that the church needed to do more to bring peace among people of of all nations, and this vision that there should be a school where people would come from all over the world and 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 learn peace. And I have to admit that I was sitting in the audience and. I I never heard that before. I I didn't know why the school was here. I was glad it was here. I loved being in Hawaii, but I really I really didn't understand. And then starting to understand the spiritual significance of Laie, um, which was a city of refuge in sort of ancient Hawaii, um, which was also a place where people go went to flee conflict and and experience peace. This idea just started germinating within me. Maybe I'm here for a reason. Maybe we're all here for a reason. President McKay said at the opening of the school that from the school would go men and women who would be influences towards the establishment of peace internationally. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time that I started to come into focus as uh, the first member of my family on either side to go to college. I didn't know what I was going to do afterwards. And uh, I, I started really deeply thinking about this and uh, had a professor who was an attorney, who was a Native rights, a Native Hawaiian rights activist who encouraged me to go to law school. I ended up going to law school at Georgetown, kind of studying like humanitarian uh, international uh, law and uh, get introduced to uh, Dennis Ross, who was the chief negotiator for Middle East peace at the time. He was just there as a speaker uh, on campus uh, while I was a student there. And when he was speaking, he started talking about the challenges of the peace process and what was going on and why it was failing and looked out to the audience, which had a bunch of young law students in it and said, look, it's going to be on your generation to figure, figure this out. And that was really a transformative moment for me. At that moment, I decided, look, I think I want to do mediation. I think I want to do conflict resolution. I think I want to work in these sort of large scale conflicts. He actually uh, hooked me up with a, a man a few days later that worked with Martin Luther King down at George Mason University. I went and began studying mediation uh, with him and, and ended up doing a joint degree in law at Georgetown, but co- actual conflict analysis and resolution at, at George Mason at their school there, ended up going back to sort of my ancestral home in Northern Ireland uh, while I was in grad school during the peace accords that were there uh, and started to work on my first peace process, you know, on the ground, working in the community as a as an intern for the United Nations there. And, uh, you know, from that, I just gained this deep passion for doing work in the Middle East. And I, I didn't uh, re- really everywhere, but the Middle East became something that was really important to me because, you know, there was a lot of religious connotations in the, in the conflict in Ireland, Mm -hmm. Catholics and Protestants, you know, fighting over God and both of them coming back to an origin story that, that, you know, starts in Jerusalem. And, uh, uh, I ended up going uh, out to Jerusalem and uh, meeting some people. I ended up working on a couple of projects, including for the Paris center for peace. And, uh, you know, decided, look, this is where I'm going to, this is where I'm going to work. Uh, and I'm going to, wow. I'm going to dedicate my life to, to working here in Jerusalem, 
in the Middle East with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I've worked with everything from nonprofits to the U.S. State Department. You know, I've probably been there now close to 60, 60 times, uh, you know, on trips uh, and and then started uh, the David O. McKay Center for Intercultural Understanding here at BYU-Hawaii, sort of simultaneously at, at that at that same time. I had an alternative life as an ESPN NBA analyst that we probably don't need to get, get into. That's just Tim probably too- Tim informed me. Too, too weird. I, I, told, uh, I told Aubrey, you're the, actually the most interesting man in the world, but we don't need to yeah. get into that. Yeah. Though it, it did help in a certain way because- Turns out Israelis and uh, are are fanatics about basketball as well. Really? And my work at ESPN leveraged and opened a lot of doors for me no to be way. able to get in and talk to people and and get them excited. And and frankly, the project that I've worked on that I actually think has had the most success is a basketball project called Peace Players that brings Israelis and Palestinians together. It teaches wow. them how to play basketball. They're the only mixed team of Israelis and Palestinians in the entire country wow. uh, that play basketball um, together. And the sort of diplomacy that they've been able to do, uh, the ability to bring communities and parents together um, across those boundaries that are usually very thick that people don't cross, uh, has has actually tied those two worlds together in, in in a really real, real way, and and it's meant that I've just developed relationships, not just with, you know, government officials, but just everyday people, parents, their children. I've worked so long there now that some of those mm -hmm. children now have children uh, yeah. that 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 are that are in the program and working on the ground and in, in communities where I think a lot of this work uh, needs to be done. So I'm deeply passionate about it. I have a deep love for the Israeli and Palestinian people. Those relationships run run so deep for me, and you know, mm -hmm. part of the reason I, I agreed to come on today is you know my heart is breaking for what is happening um, right now in in Israel and Gaza. This is the worst that I've seen it since I've been over there. There's so much pain that that both sides are are, are feeling right now. A sense of hopeful hopelessness that they're never going to see peace in, in their lifetime. Uh, so much anger, uh, so much grief, so much loss. And uh, and uh, I think that side of the story needs to be heard more and 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 talked about talked about more because these are human beings at the end of the day. These are our brothers and sisters who are starving and dying and scared and uh, and I want to help in any way I can. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. I want to, I mean, and before we get into maybe some of the specifics of the the conflict and its implications, I, I'm curious about zooming in maybe on that last statement that you made about all of these people being our brothers and sisters, you know, fellow human beings. And it's making me wonder this call to peace that you felt even from an early age, did, did you feel like it was a call to you as you, or maybe in some ways also a call to you as a latter as a Latter Day Saint. And is there something in our theology and our understanding of the gospel that calls us toward toward peace and humanization? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I I didn't think a lot about it, about it. You know, my my family joined the church when I was I was really young. They were converts to the church, but then left the church when I was also really young. And I didn't really get reintroduced to the church until I was. You know, fifteen, you know, years years old in in Kansas City, and we actually had a lot of racial polarization in Kansas mm -hmm. City at the time. There was a lot of division there. A lot of people don't know that Kansas City, as a as a as a city as a school district, was one of the last school districts in the country to let, allow their schools to be segregated or uh, mm -hmm. desegregated, um, and. Uh, and I didn't always go to the church for the answers to that. I, I don't. I don't know that I was a sophisticated enough of that. It, it, it wasn't until I was at BYU Hawaii that I started to say, you know, there's something about this place that's actually quite unique. These people from a hundred different mm -hmm. countries going to school together, who it's not perfect, but you know, generally people really get along. They're build, building deep these meaningful um, friendships, including people that come from countries that are at war with each other or who typically sort of hate each other. And it really wasn't until Elder Maxwell spoke that I started to think, is there, is there a call in my faith mm -hmm. to peace building 
that I hadn't considered before. And, and to be honest, it, it was about six months of studying everything from the Book of Mormon to the to the Bible, to trying to just understand it, reading at what President McKay was writing and saying and talking about the time I read his journals. I went back and looked at some of the you know founding documents that are there. And by the time I left here, I had this burning fire inside of me that not only was this a call to discipleship as a Latter-day Saints, this was a call to Christian discipleship, that this, this was in many ways the call of Jesus in a way that maybe before in my life I would have said, you know, proselyting or like, you know, sharing the gospel is sort of the, the you know, the call to Jesus, which it certainly is, or, you know, you know, church service and, and, you know, serving in my ward, which it certainly is. Uh, but, but this became, you know, so big, it changed the way. And, and to be honest, as a mediator, studying mediation, a lot of people don't know that modern mediation, at least Western mediation, was created by the Mennonites and Quakers. They were oh, wow. two Christian peace churches that when they read Jesus in the New Testament, they became deeply interested in how he was resolving conflict and began to put together manuals for their members about how to better be at peace with one another. And these were their Sunday school lessons. These were the things that they wow. were talking about. They they began to frame their whole Christian experience around Jesus's role as Prince of Peace. And uh, and so as I'm studying these things now, stripped of all of those religious undertones, right? When you get a mediation manual now, you actually, a lot of them will say the most popular one on Amazon is from the Society of Friends, which is Quakers, <sighs> but there's not a scripture in it, right? There's not mm -hmm. any you know, actual connection that you'll read in the text to Christianity, but it was all starting to pop off the page for me. The New Testament was reading different to me. The Book of Mormon started reading differently to me. And, uh, you know, I'm working on a project right now. I'm writing a book about how Jesus resolves conflict because it's so deeply, studying peace building has so deeply changed my perception of Jesus and also um, how we build peace you know, through the gospel. So I see it. I think there's a lot of students here. We have, we've had now over a thousand students graduate from the peace building program here at BYU Hawaii from, I think, 88 countries now. Um, and it's just growing exponentially. Our program is just busting at the scenes as this new generation, sort of generation Z come to us hungry for that hungry for a faith that is going to also engage with the world and try to help solve the problems and the injustices that that they see in the world. It was a tough sell when I first got here as a professor starting the program. People were like, peace building at BYU? Like, what is, <laughs> what is that? Is that hippie or isn't that weird or, or what have you? And it's the opposite now. Our students are coming at 18 here to study this and have deep and meaningful ways of thinking about how to engage their home countries to go back to where they're they're oh. from and 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 to serve and it, it's it's awesome i mean it, it is awesome to see this army of young latter-day saints who are putting jesus's call to peace and president mckay's prophecy of being influences for peace at the forefront of their vocation that's amazing and let me just ask as a as a follow-up i'm curious so like part of your journey is you know, diving into the scriptures, into the Bible, into the Book of Mormon, and coming out yearning for peace. I and certainly, especially in Jesus's teachings, that you know, I find, I think what you're saying, which is a a sort of radical in some ways call to peace. The cynic might say there's plenty, you know, to some extent in the Book of Mormon, to a greater extent, I think for sure in the Bible, specifically in the Hebrew Bible, that is far from a call to peace. You know, and and. I'm not sure, th and obviously there are many readings to this, but one could be, it appears that God doesn't really love peace, you know, that God mm -hmm. truly takes a side, and in some cases will, would even advocate genocide, you know, this sort of like coming into a land, claiming it as one's own, and, you know, ridding, of it, ridding it of all its existing in inhabitants, which obviously there are echoes of that, you know, that we'll talk about today. But how did, when you were, you know, when you've studied those portions of of you know Latter Day Saint canon, how do you how do you approach it? What do you what do you read there? And especially how do you come out of it and saying saying that there's a call to peace in these scriptures? I uh, I actually think uh, I think a friend of your podcast Patrick Mason has been really helpful in in sort of thinking about the idea of of justified violence versus sanctified violence in the scriptures. First of all, 
and where God does allow people to engage in violence to protect their families and in self-defense and, and and what have you, or at times a call on his people to protect their faith or what have you, or frankly, a call to Nephi to, you know, take off Laban's head to to get the scriptures. But there are exceptions, first of all, to a deeper narrative that's even in the Old Testament about our our need to care for the poor and the needy, the least of these, to, to, to search for that time when we be, um, bend our, our swords um, into plowshares. And then the second thing is that there's a Christological approach that says that Jesus changes a lot of things that Jesus fulfills the law of Moses and some of the more violent and, uh, you know, violent ideas that, that exist there. And, you know, the best evidence of that to me is what happens in fourth Nephi after Jesus appears to the, to the Nephites, there is a uh, 200 years of Zion like peace among them when they give up the law of Moses. And it mm-hmm. says that the love of God begins begins to fill their hearts, it's very m- much more difficult to argue that Jesus is advocating, you know, for those things uh, in a higher law. And I know there's a few random scriptures, you know, in the temple or, you know, uh, you know, a, a line here or there, but most of those are taken out of context, uh, in my opinion, and most of them are not in line with what the thematic points that Jesus is hitting over and over and over and over again in the mm-hmm. scriptures. And so I, I I tend to think about conflict, you know, Tim and Aubrey as natural, and it's going to happen. And sometimes we're going to not act in a Jesus or Christ-like way. And I think God understands that. And I, and I think it's at least even for me, who's been studying peace building my whole life, doing it at home, doing it with teenagers who are defiant, you know, doing it when someone really offends me at work or whatever, it's really hard. And I believe deeply in this stuff and I, and I study it all the time. And so I I think there's a lot of grace there that God, God gives us understanding that, you know, conflict is natural and normal. But at the same time, I think that the idea of loving one another uh, that Jesus gives is a commandment. It's not, you know, if you feel like it, he he's, he's, he's calling us to do this and calling us to be better. And, and so I, I tend to look at all that stuff and say, okay, it's there, it happened. And there may even be times that even the, the most holy of people may feel like they need to engage in, in conflict like that. But the life mission, becoming like Jesus, the, the whole point of discipleship is actually towards pointing us towards peace and, and seeing each other as people and as children of God. And so where do I going to spend my time and energy on, on the, on the aberration or on where I need to be on a day-to-day life? And, you know, the last thing I'll say is, you know, people say, well, what about Hitler? Or, you know, what about Vladimir Putin or, you know, whatever. And, and I'd, I'd like to think that in most of our relationships in our life, the people that we're in conflict with are not Hitler or, or, mm-hmm. or Vladimir, Vladimir Putin, right. And in most of the conflicts that we're wrestling with, that's, that's not what we're talking about or dealing with. And so therefore we have to think of more creative ways to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it occurs to me though, that, that when you're in the middle of a real, of a conflict, I think you always feel justified. Like you, it's, you always feel like you're the, you are the exception though. Like it normally we should be peace building, but in this case it there, you're justified. And I know that very recently, even Netanyahu quoted for Samuel, like he, he is directly, he's directly quoting from this this awful, this awful episode in the Bible that I want to ignore, but like, this is, this feels like the reason why we can't ignore it because a world leader is saying, God's asking us to do it again. And so I don't know. So I, I like, how do we, how do we wrestle with it when it, when it really might have consequences because there's a disagreement about who, who's justified and who's the other. I I love, I love Aubrey, how just even talking about it the way that you just talked about it, I think is super helpful and naming it for what it is. It's justification, right? Mm -hmm. I had a really early incident with one of my conflict professors that, that rocked my world in a lot of ways. I'm studying conflict. I'm in grad school. And of course, what comes to mind are my own conflicts, right? We're studying all this stuff, but I'm thinking about my own. And here I have this professor who's a master at conflict resolution. And I want to come in and I want to talk to him, talk with him about it. 
but I also want to look cool. And I also want him to think well of me. And so I have to figure out a way to talk about it without me looking bad because I'm embroiled in the conflict, which I frankly think is probably most of our conflict stories and narratives, right? Yeah. When when we explain it to others, we do it in a way that justifies ourselves and doesn't really yeah. give that same grace or that same sort of justification to other people. So I, I'm careful in thinking about it. I'm sitting in his office. I go through, it's a family conflict. I go through the whole thing at the end and I'm just like, you know, what, what should I do? And he pauses for a long time. And then he looks at me and he says, you know, you know, I've found in, in these sorts of things that you can either be right or you can have peace, but you can't have both. So I guess my question to you is, what do you want? And I was stunned and actually slightly offended because I, I really wanted to say I can have both. I can both be right and at the same time, you know, uh, and there's this concept in Hawaiian that I love. I, I love the Hawaiian language. And there's this word, pono, which means righteous or right. And when we think about we're being pono with each other, like we're, we're good with each other, we're in a good space together, all, all things are, are right or righteous. But then the Hawaiians have another word, which is pono pono. And that is of which what is most right. I can be pono and not pono pono, right? At the same time. So I can be right but not the most right in the moment. And I think that that's what the professor was trying to tell me about this. Like I can be right on the merits. I can be right on the facts. I can be right about who is right and who is wrong in the situation and be deeply wrong with the person at exactly the same, the same time. And I, and I think this is what you're describing that starts to happen in our conflict. I'm so obsessed about finding justification for why I'm right and the other person is wrong that I lose sight of the deeper commandment of loving of loving one another. I've caught myself, even after studying peace building, on my knees at night saying, Heavenly Father, please reap down havoc upon this person who is a blockade in my life. Yeah, I, I won't be violent towards them, but if you were at least a little bit violent, you know, maybe like a sickness or, you know, or something or, you know, something that, you know, gets them back or, you know, takes care of this problem for me. And then in the same prayer, but Heavenly Father, with my mistakes, can you please show me grace? Can you please, can you please show me forgiveness? Can you please understand I don't mean it? I'm struggling with something right now. I feel really badly that I'm doing something, please show me forgiveness and mercy and grace. And and stood up for my prayer and noticed, <laughs> right, the contradiction there that I, I I want this sort of mercy and grace for myself and I and I want justice, you know, for others. And and so I guess to my point, you saying that and being aware of that, that I'm justifying something right now. If I can even just get to that point where I recognize that's what I'm doing, justification is not sanctification. I'm not pursuing that which is most holy when I'm justifying. I might be pursuing something that I'm right on the merits, but I'm not per pursuing something that brings peace, that brings connection, that fosters love, that fosters reconciliation and healing. And, and to God, who is all about restoration, to God, who is all about reconciliation, to Jesus, who bleeds from every pore for our sins when the right thing to do might to be give justice. That is the sanctified path of Jesus. That That is the walk of Jesus, as I, I, like, I like to say. And I want to be about that walk. And whenever I'm sitting sitting down trying to justify it or blame or trying to find a way to get the upper hand over someone or trying to force someone else to admit that they're wrong and I'm right or what have you, what I'm not doing is the walk of Jesus at that moment. And what I'm going to reap is more conflict, not, not peace. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Are there any favorite before we move on from scripture, like, are there, are there any favorite stories that come to mind for you that really exemplify the kind of peace building that you're, that you love? Well, you know, look, uh, I, I wouldn't be a peace builder, an LDS peace builder, if I, I didn't love the anti-Nephi Lehi's. And I know it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's overused so much, but to me, it's such a powerful story and has an outcome that is sanctified as opposed to justified. And really the, mm. the only war that you see in the book of Mormon where there's plenty of wars where 
one side ha feels like they have a legitimate justification to go to war to defend their families, to take care of themselves, you know, what have you. But the anti-Nephi-Lehi's have a sanctifying outcome. There is actually a change of heart. There is a turning of people towards each other. They put themselves at risk. They literally do what Jesus commands, which is to, when someone slaps me on one cheek, that I stand my ground and I give to them the other cheek. And and I and I think a lot about that that scripture, Aubrey, and the book that I'm writing, I'm calling it 70 times seven, and it's really sort of connected to this idea that I think for a lot of the world, when they hear that that commandment from Jesus, they think it's passive. What Jesus is yeah. saying is, hey, let people, let people roll over you. You know, when you know, just just don't get in their way. But I think the anti-Nephi Lehi story is a great example of it because. Jesus says, stand our ground. So the anti-Nephi-Lehi's who are encouraged in the scriptures actually to run away from the Lamanites, they're actually encouraged to go save yourselves. Like, we don't want you to take up arms, but flee and we'll send an army to fight in your behalf. Don't do that. They they actually go out and it says in the scriptures, they meet their brethren. Man, I, I love that line, right? These are their enemies that are seeking to kill them. But for the, for the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, these are our brethren. And we're going to meet them on the battlefield and we're going to kneel down before them. And even as they start to smite us, even when the temptation is the highest to go and grab those weapons or to flee, to fight or to flight, those sort of natural responses to conflict, they turn the other cheek and it has a dramatic effect of softening the hearts uh, of, of the Lamanites. And, and when I think about it, a teaching that encapsulates Jesus to me the most, this teaching that comes out of the Sermon of the Mount. And then a follow-up discussion that happens later when Peter is asking, like, well, like, you know, how many times, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious, like, you know, maybe once, you know, I think Peter says, you know, maybe seven is, is, you know, the appropriate, you know, to which Jesus responds 70 times seven shows to me the deepness of that our commitment, our discipleship is about reconciliation. So I do it as many times as I need to do it to be reconciled with, with my brother. Uh, and that this is Jesus's pattern over and over and over again in the scriptures. It's, it's the essence of the first scripture that he reads in Nazareth in his hometown as he's announcing his Messiahship in, in Isaiah that, that gets him almost thrown off a cliff by people because he was announcing a Messiahship that was about love and, love and restoration and connection and not a messiahship that was based off of military strength, of defeating the Romans and the enemies, of, of creating justice for Israel's enemies. And, and, I, and I think the people of Nazareth really struggled, struggled with that. We want, we want God to make it right for us as opposed to have God give us the strength to make it right with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to I'd love to talk a little bit about how all of this can influence or at least maybe guide our our thinking as Latter-day Saints about this current conflict um between Israel and Hamas. Would you maybe a place we could start and I know it's so complex and you know we could spend hours, days, weeks on this, but could you give just a little bit of background, however you think how, however much you think is appropriate for the purposes of this episode to say how did we get to where we are to such a a dark and difficult place, like you said, you know, there's a sense of hopelessness. What, what, what led to this point? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. I, I want to start with a caveat, with just because of everything else that we're talking. Uh, as a, I, I'm talking through a lens of someone who's a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. I'm, I'm speaking through the lens of of a Christian and someone who's trying to follow Jesus Christ. So when I'm talking about these sort of reactions, I'm speaking to that audience, I, and and I think that's mostly the audience of this this po this mm -hmm. podcast right now. Yeah. I work in a lot of intercultural settings with a lot of people with different beliefs, with a lot of different religious beliefs. Uh, my job is never to impose my my way on them or to judge them for the ways in which they are 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 wrestling with conflict right now. I have deep respect. An affection for Jews who practice Judaism, as well as sort of secular Jews who practice other philosophies. I have a deep respect for Palestinians who who practice Islam or Christianity, or whatever it is that they they also practice as well. And so, when I say this, I just want to be clear for our listeners: I'm not trying to say what 
they should be doing. And I'm not even really trying to place blame right now on one one side or the other side about what's going on because a lot of these conflict dynamics we'll recognize in our own lives uh, and you know in, in in much in much smaller ways. But as a Latter Day Saint, how I might be thinking about this, or one at least one pot potential way of sort of thinking through some of this stuff, and I, I just want to start with that caveat because yeah, thank you. I, I certainly wouldn't want one of my friends from Israel or one of my friends uh, from Palestine to listen in on this podcast and say what I'm saying is, oh, just be like Jesus, because that's that that this this isn't a prescription for them as much as it's a prescription maybe for us thinking about how we might think about it, you know, as as, as Latter Day Saints. The way I describe this to my students is, okay, you've got a situation where you've got these two groups who believe that this land that they are on is, is theirs. And they both have significant historical and legal claims to the land, both anciently, you know, if you want to go back and point to the Cor the Quran, or if you want to go to the Bible, where there are explicit moments where God gives, you know, people land and what have you. And then more recently, what comes out of the really start of the 20th century, where you have Palestinians who are living in what is referred to at that time as Palestine, which had been part of the Ottoman Empire for years, but then becomes a British protectorate and a group of Zionists who are Jews who are in the diaspora, primarily living in Europe, who uh, are experiencing deep anti-Semitism. We think about the Holocaust during World War II, but there are all sorts of other Holocausts that have happened to the Jews throughout the centuries. And uh, this, this is a pattern that's happening in Germany. It may be the biggest and most historically noteworthy, but a pattern and, and a feeling among Zionists that we'll never be safe. We'll never, we'll never have this sort of freedom that we need to have unless we find a homeland for ourselves that that is that is ours and that is you know primarily a Jewish a Jewish state which didn't exist you know at that time it hadn't exist existed for centuries and and while there was a lot of different places that people could go obviously Israel or Palestine was the yearning of so many people because that is where they left that is where they came from the diaspora and and I, I really think the source of the the modern conflict that we have is really centering around there because as narratives started to go, there started to be Zionists who said a people without a land for a land without a people, which the Palestinians would say, excuse me, <laughs> right? There's literally millions uh, of us uh, of, of us here. And at the same time, a very cultural divide between the sort of you know pastoral communities that were Palestinians versus sort of uh you know uh, the the more modern communities that are coming together and and uh, orientalism which is sort of prejudice towards you know people of asia but includes sort of arabs in the in the process of of looking at them as somehow less than or their civilizations as less developed that got a thinking throughout europe uh and through a lot of people that that this this would be a good thing and as jews immigrated by the thousands and then by the tens of thousands and then by the hundreds of thousands primarily to tel aviv pressure at the end of World War II gained to get recognition of a state. And in the United Nations, there was a lot of debate about this. The British, gotta love the British, made promises both to the Palestinian people that were legal and binding and to the Jews that were there at the time. Uh, they were playing both sides. Uh, and both people have documents and declarations they can talk about. There was violence that increasingly started between those two sides. And then when it became clear that that the United Nations was going to support a partition uh, of land and create the state of Israel, there was a war in 1948 with all of the Arab countries essentially against Israel. Israel wins the war, takes much more land uh, than uh, was was going to much more land than what was given to them from the United Nations. There's millions of refugees that are Palestinians that flee to Egypt, that flee to Lebanon, that flee to Jordan and flee to the West Bank, which is the West Bank of the Jordan River and to Gaza. And uh, and there has been a state of, of 
conflict and uh, occupation is the word that the Palestinians will use um, ever since with a foreign power militarily occupying their land. And to Israelis, this is their land. This isn't, they're, they're not occupying anything. This is, this is their land. It's their, uh, and, and it's led to a number of different conflicts. Um, but what's, ha what's happened most recently, I'm just going to sort of jump, jump there yeah. is that one of those partitions of land in Gaza has been increasingly isolated uh, from the outside world. It's been under barricade, both from the Israeli side as well as the Egypt side. The conditions have been absolutely horrific uh, and inhumane there. The people there have grown increasingly desperate. A political party named Hamas has been quite popular there that has, uh, as one of their stated goals, the destruction of the state of Israel. Um, there have been numerous skirmishes over the years, but October 7th, uh, when a group of Hamas fighters come into settlements that are and cities that are near Gaza and and commit a massacre and also kidnap, you know, hundreds of people, uh, is the start uh, of, of this conflict. But even right before that, Palestinians will tell you that there was increasing violence in the West Bank, where Israeli settlers who were trying to gain more and more land over the area that the Palestinians live in the West Bank of Jordan were coming into communities, burning down olive trees, forcibly, violently evicting Palestinians from their homes. And, and in fact, the opening for those militia from Hamas to come in were because the Israeli army was in the West Bank trying to uh, quell you know, conflict that was going there. What has happened next though has been unprecedented. Both the attack that Hamas did was the deadliest sort of civilian attack that had really happened in the infantadas or sort of uprisings of the Palestinian people towards Israelis. And the amount of death and destruction that has happened in Gaza at the hands of the Israeli military, it just absolutely dwarfs any other military operation that, that, that has happened here. And the level of destruction uh, the level of violence, the level of men and uh, women and children that are dying, uh, the number of people that are on the verge of starvation and the growing humanitarian crisis uh, that is on the ground. This is extremely, extremely dire. Everyone is terrified. Everyone is angry. Everyone fears like peace isn't going to happen in their lifetime. People are exhausted by what's happening. You've got Israelis who have mandatory military service and have called up the reserves, which means there probably isn't a family in Israel that doesn't have someone in the military in harm's way right now. So when we say this is affecting everybody in the country, it's affecting everybody in the country. There isn't a Palestinian that doesn't have a family member or friend or connection to Gaza right now. And frankly, for everyone in Gaza has felt this in deep and deep and powerful ways. And so that's the what. And the why is a narrative that says, that God has called us to this place, that God has given us this place, that we have earned this place through through past narratives or frankly from God, God itself, and therefore we can't give it away. God doesn't negotiate that way. And that the only real solution to the problem uh, for many people is a solution where the other side kind of goes away. And those solutions just aren't very effective. And there's, certainly there's people that don't believe that and are trying to work on something together, but it's been those extremes on both sides that have held out that have kept us from having some sort of peace agreement. And I've Thank heard you. it, I've, I've heard it argued that, that Hamas was, knew very clearly the extent of the provocation on October 7th and the extent to which the response would be what it was. And so the question then becomes, and if that's true, the question becomes, why, why would you, why would you do this as Hamas? Even if, even understanding, you know, now as you've articulated the larger, the larger goal and the, the conflict over this land, why, why an attack like this, that's this brutal, that's this raw and ruthless, knowing that Israel is going to respond with overwhelming force? Look, I've heard those arguments. I don't know that we know definitively okay how well organized this was how far they thought they could get usually uh incursions into israel from gaza are met pretty swiftly with israeli military force the fact that they got unimpeded 
to the communities they got to, I think my understanding was was a shock for many of the Hamas fighters as, as much as anything else. I don't know that they they thought this was going to get them as far as they did. I don't think there's any justification for the level of of slaughter and torture and rape and murder and then kidnapping that 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 came afterwards. If you're asking like what Hamas was thinking, what the political goal of all of this is, I I think that in some ways people think there's strategy. But my experience with the conflict is that early on in conflict spirals or tornadoes, we often are are thinking deeply about how do I win this? How do I say or do that right thing? How do I pressure the other side? How do I gain leverage? But as conflicts go on and they, they, they're sustaining, and as they get more brutal, there's a mindset that happens, and, and social psychologists talk a lot about this, where our goals move away from winning and move to hurting the other side. Mm -hmm. And we think less about what will get me the victory than how do I impose suffering on, on my enemy? And, and I don't think that this explanation should be um, dismissed because it's, it's, it's been replicated in multiple types of, of scientific studies uh, of, of people that are experiencing extreme levels, le levels of conflict that, that our goals shift. And when they shift like they shift, I will do things that are counterproductive to my cause, but I really owned the other side. Or, oh man, did you see how embarrassed wow. they look? Or did you did you see their face when I did that? I know that it's coming. Look, I don't I don't want to say you two, but I've I've done the same thing. Mm -hmm. I, I I've had yeah. moments where I know I should hold my tongue, and it, anything that I say right now is going to make it worse. But when it comes out and the shock on the other person's face, when I say it, there's a certain sense of satisfaction, right? That comes over me of, oh, now they know how it feels to be me. You're making my life miserable. Now I've given you a taste of what my life looks like. And, and we lose all sense of humanity at that moment. And I, I think when you see the dehumanizing actions from Hamas and you see the way that Gazans have been dehumanized and innocent women and children have, have been dehumanized in this process. I think, and you can ask the exact same question of Israel, what is the goal? What do you think is going to happen? You are going to leave a generation of Palestinians who have had the highest hatred towards Israel of any generation before them. You have Arabs and Muslims all over the world now who were starting to get into normalization agreements with Israel that are now watching their brothers and sisters brutalized in ways that they've never had before. You're watching political support for Israel in the United States erode in ways that really are at historic lows. I mean, this used to be one bipartisan thing that you could talk about in the United States was that Republicans and Democrats supported Israel, and that is dramatically shifting and changing, especially among the young generation. And you ask yourself, why do it? Why not call a ceasefire? Why not stop? Why not let more humanitarian service in? And and what's the strategy? And sometimes I, I, I don't know that the strategy isn't just right now that they don't feel sufficiently punished, wow. right? They don't feel sufficiently punished for what they did, what they did to us. And until they do so, until they get to the point that they feel like we will never, ever go against Israel again, because the costs were so high, we're not going to stop. And unfortunately, in conflict, unless we're going to get to genocide, unless we're going to get to the point that there's literally no one left, the more violent we are, the more that we are sowing the seeds of the next conflict. And so I, I don't think that that's ultimately a realistic, realistic goal for Israel. But it's a very normal response to highly destructive, escalated conflict. Yeah, I really love what you said about that. You know, we are approaching this as Christians, and so the the answer is always going to be, or or the the conversation will always be pretty introspective. Like, what is Jesus asking us as Christians to do? And I can see this in myself. You know, from across the world, I I feel like the scramble to 
to paint a villain because if if there's a villain it kind of relieves you of this this burden of suffering with a sibling with like a with a fellow human and so it's it's easier to decide that that somebody deserves this in some way and so i i would really love for you to tell us about some of the human stories on both sides that have especially affected you because for me that's what instantly breaks that down like it just it destroys that that sort of like way out when you've when you really like made a connection with someone who you realize is just like you Aubrey that's a that's such a beautiful point I I really appreciate appreciate you making it by by kind of bringing it back to us and that natural desire that we have to want an ally and want an enemy enemy want to know like which side we should be on yeah. which is the good side yeah. which is the bad side and and then when we go into that side we go all in yeah. right and and what you're not saying is the minute i start thinking about my brother or sister as enemy it it's going to lead to dehumanization it's going to lead to a loss or a sense of that this is a a, a brother and sister of, of of god a child of god or what have you and, and then i start doing wrongs even on a conflict that's thousands of miles away i start violating commandments i start getting roped into a sort of thinking that actually doesn't help the situation but hurts it and and i'm doing it as a i'm doing it as someone who's very very far away and you know it's been really interesting as you know i've been working on this uh, you know, in Hawaii, there's not a lot of people connected to this place the same way that I am. And I have people coming up to me all the time telling me which side is the right side. And they they learned about this uh, four months ago. Like they never really thought deeply about this conflict until four months ago. And people screaming at me um, about which side I should be on or which one's right. And, and even sort of yelling at me about my peace work there because it it didn't work or it, uh, you know, it it privileged one side um, or the other side. And one of the things that I think gets lost in this whole process is the voices of everyday Israelis and Palestinians. I know we think we get them because we have social media. And I know that we think because there are TikTok accounts that are out there or that there are social media influencers that are out there that are from those places, that th those voices are representative of, of everyone. And so the first thing I caution all of our students is, do, do you think with the social media influencers that you follow, that they're the voice of your whole generation? Do they all speak for you? Uh, you know, and just because they have a lot of likes or just because they have a lot of views or what have you, I, I think the answer we can easily sort of recognize is, is, is no. And so, and, and certainly they do represent a voice and, and certainly there are voices that want to see no Palestinians left in Israel. And there are certainly voices that want to see no Israelis left in Israel. There are people who chant from river to the sea. And when they mean that, they mean that it's our people and only our people from the river to the sea that mean it. But for the vast, vast majority of people that I have met, um, they don't want that at all. They want to live their lives. They want to raise their children. They want to own a house. They want to go to their kids' soccer and bas basketball games. They want to go to the grocery store and be able to afford meals. They want to go practice their faith. They want to be able to uh, ride on a bus or go to a, a movie without fearing um, you know, for their life. They uh, and, and the folks that I've worked with have done something even braver, in my opinion. They've decided that the only way that they get there, the only way they get to that level of security is by recognizing that I do it collaboratively with the other side. And so I need to start building those, those bridges. And, and one of the things that's so heartbreaking for me right now is that we, we can see on our social media feeds all the time, the violence, the war, but very rarely do we see the painstaking work that for decades Israelis and Palestinians, many of them young, many of them in generation Z or millennials who have defied their communities, defied their parents, made friends with the other side, participated in projects together, have tried to work to break down barriers between their local villages and communities. 
so that they can work and live together in peace and have had success at this, have actually been able to do everything from play basketball together. I work with an organization called Peace Players who have Israelis and Palestinians playing basketball and they're they have a joint team that goes and plays in Israel cities throughout Israel. Uh, the only team that has Israelis and Palestinians playing together, they're good on top of it, which is even better. So any of the haters that say, well, you're doing this for peace, but you stink at basketball. <laughs> they won the Jerusalem City Championship uh, uh -huh. a few years ago as well. There are people that are building restaurants where if you bring in somebody from the other side, you get your meal at half off, but you have to sit down with somebody from the other side wow. uh, and wow. eat hummus across the table. There are people who are building organizations that use theater, for example, and Israelis and Palestinians are writing plays together. They're performing them both in Arabic and in Hebrew and going back into the communities and talking about ways of living together. There are economic partnerships that people are making where different communities are growing different types of vegetables or fruits or what have you and creating open markets that are in spaces where for the first time, Israelis and Palestinians are crossing over and shopping and creating economic opportunity in these in these markets, there are women, and I think this is a really, really, really important point because it's been so powerful. There are a lot of there are a lot of uh, religious boundaries, especially in Islam for women. But there are women who are leading the forefront of doing peace education, going into communities and uh, and and working on helping them understand that for our children's sake, we do not want them growing up in the same, level of fear of having to run to the bomb shelter uh and like almost every home there has one uh has a safe room uh and a and a bomb shelter there we want them to be able to walk down the streets and be able to share in, in connection with each other and and if you haven't been there and if you haven't been in these communities and you haven't just like attended middle school or high school with these young people like I have, or attended religious services or going to sporting events or concerts or, or what have you, they are human beings just like us that want to live a life um, in peace and they're trying. And when things like this happen, uh, the it's so hard for that work to continue. It's so hard for them to look in the face of their parents and their peers and their brothers and sisters and say, I'm going to continue to be friends with or continue to be in dialogue with or continue to be in business with someone from the other side after something as atrocious as this has happened. And so the enemies of peace want this division. I think that's clear. I think something that we could probably say on both sides is you know, that Hamas doesn't like this sort of work right uh that that that's happening right there are many fundamentalist israelis that don't like this sort of work and punish their own people for engaging um in this type of work because collaboration doesn't give justification right and and people working together and living together and finding ways to to grow their economies don't fit into the narrative of that the only way that we have peace is for the other side to go away, right? And and, and this is where I think at, from, from a Latter-day Saint perspective, if I'm so, sort of thinking about like what is helpful, I want to be a voice for peace. I want to be a voice for those people, for the vast majority of people that want to have some level of normalcy, some level of economic security, some some level of political voice and and political power um, within their communities, something Palestinians, you know, sorely lack, and and some sort so sense of self determination. So I, I love this quote. If I can read it, this is uh, I don't know if you've ever read this book by Donna Hicks. It's called um, Donna Hicks' book is called Dignity, and uh, she does this amazing work, in my opinion, of thinking about how human dignity sets at the root of all peace building. That if you're going to get to sustainable peace, human beings need to feel that they are human to other people. And, and this is what she says. The glue that holds all of our relationships together is the mutual recognition of the desire to be seen, to be heard, to be listened to and treated fairly, to be recognized, understood, and to feel safe in the world. 
When our identity is accepted and we feel included, we are granted a sense of freedom and independence and a life filled with hope and possibility. And, you know, whenever I read those words, I ask people this question, is that true for you? Right? Like, in, you know, think about the, the quote as for you. Do you desire to be seen? Do you desire to be heard, listened to? Is it important for you to be treated fairly? Do you feel like it's important to be recognized or understood? Do you want to feel safe in the world? Do you want to feel accepted for who you are? Do you want people to understand you and and treat you with grace um, and understanding? And you know, I see Aubrey nodding your head and Tim nodding your head, and, and that's everybody. And then, so how is it so hard to understand that our enemy desires exactly those same th those same things? They they desire those same things. Some of them go about it wrong. Some of them go about it and choose me means that are not going to get them there. But it's the root at what what people are, are feeling. And so we start to build peace by learning about those stories, by by reading about those stories, by paying attention to this other thing that is equally true. And it's true right now. You know, I'll be honest, after October 7th, I, I just some of the organizations I worked with, just in talking to the families, talking to the workers on the ground. It was dire. I, I I was up all hours of the night because in Hawaii it's you know it's it's a twelve hour difference and would come to school here a wreck um, every day um, because something that I worked on for twenty years and for people that I really cared about I I didn't know if it was gone. You know these are extreme circumstances that both sides and these people are facing. And one of the things that has been so beautiful to me is that. Yes, there have been people who've given up on the peace process. Yes, people I know and respect and care for greatly have said, I just can't participate anymore. I'm in too much pain. I, I'm, I'm too angry. I'm too upset. But the vast majority are fighting through this, are, are fighting for peace. And if I can tell you one story yes, please. that maybe can put, put all this into perspective, when I was with peace players in the early going of, of things, we decided to have an activity in Tel Aviv. We're normally working in Jerusalem, but we decided to have a Tel Aviv mostly because the facilities were so much better. And we thought it'd be fun for the kids to go to this really amazing park in Tel Aviv and have this awesome opportunity. We were a little bit nervous, but frankly, we felt Tel Aviv was a pretty safe place to take you know, Palestinians and Israelis. But we, we had rented a basketball court. And when we got to the court, there was a bunch of Israeli men that were playing on the court. And when they saw that we had, first of all, girls, and the second thing we saw that we had Muslim girls and Palestinian girls, they refused to give up the court. They just said, we're not, we, we'd rented the court, we'd reserved it. They just said, forget it. You guys can't play here. This is, this is our park. We started working with the park officials. Eventually, you know, the authorities got involved and they came down. And so the men decided that they were going to do this okay, we technically can't be on the court, but we are going to ring the outside of the court. We're going to stand along the outside of the court. And as these girls play, we're going to mock them. Um, this is not ideal peacemaking stuff. And I'm, I'm sure there's some people who are working for nonprofits now saying, what were you thinking? Like, why didn't you pull the kids out of there? And, and frankly, what we're thinking is this is their life on a day-to-day -day basis. If we can't f face this or peacemake in the face of this, there are no safe spaces there, right? So you've got to work with what you've got to work with. As the game was going on, they were jeering, they were laughing, and uh, you know, at the girls, they were they were really disruptive. I was coaching one of the teams, and I had to be held back by assistant coach one time. I was about ready to go over there and punch somebody in the face. I was so so frustrated. And as we went into the huddle, there was this Palestinian girl, fourteen years old. And as we huddled together and I was, you know, thanking the girls for, you know, playing and, and being brave in the moment, she walked away from the huddle and walked over to the men and stuck out her hand and in Hebrew said to them, thank you for letting us use your court. And one by one, their heads went down, ashamed, and their, their, and their hands went out and started shaking on their hands. I'm crying on the sideline watching this girl do something incredibly, incredibly brave. 
a leader, a peace builder, someone who was going to go to her university and become the class president and work with the Palestinians in an all-Palestinian university to create programs like this for Israelis, someone who was brave on social media and Facebook to tell her friends, I know you hate all Israelis right now, but let me tell you a story. And then in, in one of the most beautiful moments that I've ever seen, she's on a trip to New York. It's Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement for Jews. There's intense fighting that's happening in Israel right now. There are lots of people on edge, lots of Israelis on edge. We're meeting the Israeli girls want to go to Yom Kippur services, but they want to bring their Palestinian friends. So we're negotiating with a rabbi. Can, can, can their friends come? Is this okay? Or asking the Palestinian girls, is this okay? They're now in their 20s. Is a congregation going to be okay? And the, the rabbi says, like, this is the day of atonement. We need to talk. We need, I'm actually going to invite you to speak and speak at the sermon. Mostly the Israeli girls spoke, but she said, you know, look, this is the day of atonement. And as I understand it, this is the day um, that you talk about forgiveness, that you talk about connection. And uh, I want you to know that I've had a hard life as a Palestinian. And, and she talks a little bit about some of the things that have happened to her at the hands of Israelis. But then she says, but I want you to know that I love you, that I forgive you, that these girls here are my sisters, and that I believe that we can make peace together. There was not a tear, there was not a dry eye in the audience as she spoke. These are the same people that we talk about and, 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 and make them into enemies. Or these are the same people that we talk about and try to dehumanize them or try to say who's, who's right or wrong. And this is where this breaks, breaks my heart because there are thousands of them, thousands and thousands of them in Israel and Palestine who what they need from us is that level of support. They need us cheering them on. They need us asking our governments to be part of the solution not part of the problem. They they need us to be telling their stories. And whenever the stereotypes or the dehumanizing things come back, they need us remembering um, that there are brothers and sisters and that, that our job as Christians and Latter-day Saints is restoration, is restoring those relationships, is reconnecting all of God's children together and the way we talk about our brothers and sisters what we advocate for them, not giving justification for violence and, and, and hurting each other, but giving justifications and sanctifications for peace. Uh, that is, that, that is, that is how we help them. That's so powerful. Thank you for sharing all of that. I, I'm curious when you say, you know, when you say some of those things about what we could do here, you know, encouraging our government to be part of the, you know, part of the solution, not part of the problem. I'm, I'm longing for, you know, some more concrete steps. Like here I am on the Wasatch Front in Utah. And I think a big part of this that, that's like resonant for me is just living peace building in my own life and sort of trusting in the universe that that, that matters in some way. But beyond that, is there, is there something that, that we can do Act, to be an active part of the peace process as it pertains to this this conflict? You know, they always ask the same thing, Tim, like, because a lot of times I'm working with people in their 20s or in their teens or in the, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> right? I'm from this small village, like, you know, you know, what can yeah. I, what can I do? So I, I want to, if I can, I want to talk about four things that I get out of Jesus in the New Testament, especially, and then think about and then the second thing is about how all big peace starts small. And the scripture from the Book of Mormon, my favorite one from the Book of Mormon, that by small and simple things mm. are, are great things brought to pass. The first one we've talked a lot about on this podcast already, but one way that 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 Paul refers to it in the New Testament is opening the eyes of our heart, right? Not just seeing with our worldly eyes, but seeing with the eyes of our heart. If we can't see Israelis and Palestinians with the eyes of our heart, nothing else is going to happen. If we can't try to see them the way that Jesus would see them, we are going to be trapped in the same sort of enemy contender defender models that they're trapped in, right? Where I'm right, they're wrong. 
they're the enemy, they're the bad person. I need I need to defeat them. Jesus invites us in all sorts of spaces to open up our eyes and see. And what we need to be seeing is the divinity of the people. And 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 especially Jesus was interested in us doing this with our enemies, right? It's one thing to see our friends that way. It's one thing to see our family, even though, frankly, sometimes family is the hardest to see, you know, with the eyes of our heart, but to see our enemies that way. I mean, that single thing, if we can just work on every day, finding ways of humanizing and and seeing stories and seeing those people, there's something that changes inside that gives us a lot of direction about what we're actually supposed to do next. And when I work with Israelis and Palestinians on the ground, all of that work at first is that one thing, opening up their eyes to seeing the humanity of the other side. Collaboration, good conflict resolution, coexistence don't happen unless that happens. The second thing is is rolling away our stones. You know, there's this... Myth, great moment in the new testament when you know jesus is asked about you know the stoning of this woman caught in adultery and jesus says you know he that is without sin cast the first stone but there's a theme throughout the new testament as well that blame and stone throwing don't promote reconciliation or restoration they're destructive in nature they tear down where jesus's role is to build up right where our goal isn't to destroy our enemy, to but reconnect. And the more stones that we're throwing, the more that we wound other people. I see this especially true in social media, where I think people feel more of an, an ability to say things, thinking that maybe it will never actually sort of directly impact or hurt the other person. There's a lot of stone throwing that goes around right now. It doesn't help Israelis or Palestinians for us to go back and try to pinpoint the moment in time that this person started it or this person's right or this person's wrong, we're at a point that is so dangerous and that is so devastating and that is so wrong on, on all accounts of, of, of the way people are hurting. Throwing more stones is only escalates a conflict. It doesn't de-escalate it. And, mm -hmm. and having this practice in my own life of, of remembering that story as I have a great stone there that I, I, I just want to, I want to chuck. <laughs> at that other person, you know, Jesus, Jesus, and I, I say roll away instead of just put them aside because, you know, at the resurrection, the stone is rolled away, the restoration, this, this sort of moment when all things are, when we are saved happens with a stone that's rolled away with Jesus. The second one is take the risk of embrace, like reach out to, or try to embrace someone that is different than ourselves. There are ways, especially in our day and age, to actually connect with people who we don't understand, that we could actually listen to and try to engage in deep listening within the other side. Our, our tendency in conflict is to polarize or to disengage, right? And sometimes I, I, I talk about it like a human diagram of two people standing back to back, like elbowing each other. They can't see each other, but they can definitely feel each other, right? And when I when I talk to people about this, the most dangerous thing to do is what they're saying is, why is this other person elbowing me? And maybe if I just elbow them a little harder, they'll stop. But I, I don't understand why they're doing this. And, and sometimes even when I stop elbowing, they keep elbowing me. And the desire is the other person should stop. And But I'm going to keep elbowing and my back's going to keep turned until the other person stops. So in other words, when they they change their way they see me, I can stop elbowing them. I'll stop throwing stones when they stop throwing stones, right? And so the, the trickiest part, whether this is a family mediation or working with corporations or communities or whatever, is they always want somebody else to go first. They always want someone else to do the trust building sort of mechanism. And one of the, the reasons I love so many of the people that I work with in the Middle East was they were the first to turn towards the other person and say, you don't see me, but I'm going to see you. You don't understand me. You don't care about me. You carry stereotypes about me. You may be throwing rocks, but uh, but I'm going to see you. And I used to like illustrate this on a stage and I would have somebody and I would elbow them back to back and I'd tell them to turn in front of me. And what they would do is they try to get in front of me. So we're back to back and then they would try to move. So we're face to face with each other. And I would just turn away and they'd get frustrated. Sometimes they'd like, grab me and like try to make me, you know, see, see them. And I would ask, well, why didn't that work? 
And it takes a while for people to say, oh, turning first towards someone is not actually about them seeing me. So then they recognize mm -hmm. what a great person I am and they stop throwing stones at me. It's about me seeing them and not doing that. So it ends up with someone just basically staring at me in the back. That's what it sort of looks like on the stage, right? And people get there. But I had this one moment. I'll never forget it. I've done this like a hundred times. And at this one moment, there's 500 people in the audience. And this, this woman is up there doing this back-to-back -back thing with me and I'm trying to get her. And I tell her, I tell her, you know, turn first towards me. She turns around and then she reaches in and she wraps her arms around me and rests her head on the back of my neck and just embraced me. I, I was shocked. I didn't really know what to do. I'd never seen anybody <laughs> sort of do that before. But it, it, it welled up, something welled up inside of me. And, and I, I remembered that, you know, Jesus doesn't just turn and look at us. He, he embraces us, his arms, his arm come out to us. Like it's, it's one thing to say, I see you. It's another thing to embrace, embrace you. Like, what would it look like to embrace our enemy? It's risky. It's vulnerable. They may not want it. They may throw a stone back at us because we're freaking them out right now because we're trying to, you know, connect with them. But we have to understand that that could be part of the process. And if it doesn't work the first time, it can work the second or maybe the third or the fourth or what have you. But when arms, when I understand that Jesus's arms are constantly outstretched to me, that Jesus is always sort of inviting space. When I do that, I can give that same sort of love to others. And this is why I always think that Jesus tries to tie the first and second grace commandment together, love of God and love your neighbor as ourself. When we can experience the love of God, when we can experience that God's arms are outstretched towards us and in that embrace, that gives us the power to do that same thing towards our neighbor right? And, and so they're, they're, they're connected together in a deep way because we can't do it alone. We need that. We need that level of strength. And then the last thing is that relationship thrive when there is, when things are just or pono. And so after that embrace, what am I doing to make sure that the conditions on the ground are just for people? You can't ask Palestinians who are living in dehumanizing conditions to just accept a brace and say, well, I love you, brother, but you're going to be starving, right? Like we should always be thinking that reconciliation is about also about making things right that have been wrong, right? About restoring people, whether that's giving them truth or giving them forgiveness or giving them restitution or justice or or saying, I am going to show you and prove to you that I'm changing my patterns in a way that you can feel safe being in connection in, in relationship to me. And, you know, those four steps, I just see Jesus constantly doing, constantly inviting, right? This last act of restoration is, is repentance in some ways. And I think we often have a negative connotation to it, but Jesus is in repentance is inviting restoration. He's inviting us back into embrace and and there's a pattern and a way to do it. How do I do it from from Utah or someone else like that? I think, you know, Tim started with like, okay, it starts, frankly, I know that you may not think this would make any difference to an Israeli or Palestinian, but almost all of them will tell you when I worked with them, their first rec reconciliations and restorations were with family members. They weren't with Israelis or Palestinians. Wow. On the other side, they practiced this with the people that were close and they practice being peaceful. They practice letting go of grudges that were frankly, probably a little easier to let go of than the sort of bigger ones that were there. The second thing that I would say is, you know, what can I do is when I am talking about and thinking about situations in the world, whether it's Israel, Palestine, Russia, Ukraine, political polarization between Democrats and Republicans in, in the United States, right now, something that is breaking up families, getting families to not even like speak together with anybody yeah. anymore. I can recognize that there is Pono and there is Pono Pono. And I can be right and not have peace, or I can be the most right and have peace. And, and that requires for me to be curious, to get to understand people who are different from me, to not shut myself off from them, but to engage, engage with them 
to be proactive, like the anti Nephi Lehi's and coming down and like, and, 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 and bending down in some ways or lowering uh, ourselves as the Samoans say in Ifonga, like we, we lower ourselves so that we can deeply let that, that humanity pierce us. If you've got a problem with the Palestinians right now, I would recommend that you go and try to seek out stories that humanize Palestinians, that help you understand their day-to-day -day life. If you have a problem with the Israelis right now, I think there's so much that you could do to connect. I know there's so many Jewish Americans. I know there's so many Palestinian Americans out there right now that would love to talk to you and love to explain their stories to them. Don't live in an assumptive world created by a narrative on social media or on TikTok or through a political um, narrative. Do the walk of Jesus which is to get deeply and understand the humanity of the people that we're talking about. And then the last thing is all of our government starts at a local level. It absolutely does. And insisting that the leaders that we support are going to be leaders that support this, this, this walk or this life that they're leaders that seek to inject life and restoration and community and, and peace uh, and promote you know, understanding and connection. And that are leaders that want to promote divisiveness or hatred or othering or dehumanization or creating ites. We know enough from our scriptures to know how badly that's going to go. And so that, that, that we're vocal about it, even if that leader is right on issues that are really important to us. Right. Even if that leader stands for some things that are really, really valuable to us, that we value the most pono of those things, that I would rather be right with my neighbor than my enemy, than to be right on this one political idea or 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 principle. You know, Spencer Cox has been talking a lot about disagreeing better. And we disagree better when we listen. And we disagree better when we actually assert the humanity of the other side. And we disagree better when we are willing to do the work of collaboration so that we find a way to create spaces that work for, for everybody. Wow. Thank you so much, Chad. This is so, I, I'm remembering that Terrell Givens once in, in an episode, he talked about making an idol of your own integrity. And that phrase has always stuck in my head. And I think that's what the, the Pono versus Pono Pono that you know, sometimes it's it it is it becomes indulgent to be the most right and on something so particular that you're actually not peace building anymore and i think with this conflict of course and also just that it's an election year in the us that this is going to become an issue in very intimate spaces you know in families tim shriver just last week quoted a survey that said that 30% of us citizens have ended relationships family relationships because of differences in politics and and so i can and i i i can see it in myself in the name i usually call it boundaries or integrity or something but i think i'm projecting i mean i'm i'm protecting a vulnerability or or a, a fragility so that I, so I can feel good about it, but also not really have to engage because it is it is so vulnerable and it can be so painful to stay engaged in conversations where there's tension. And so I this is just so powerful. And I know that it will be really meaningful this year as we're navigating uh, a lot of tension and um, difficult places where there might not be an obvious right answer. And everybody's probably got a little bit of something true, you know. I wanted to ask. There's this maybe idea among religious people or even some Latter-day Saints that conflicts and wars like this might be signs of the times, that it's, you know, wars and rumors of war, and that it's sort of a precursor to the second coming, something that's inevitable in some way. And I think for some people, that might be a reason to not engage or be particularly worried about this because it's something that's been prophesied. And there's not not too much that we can do about it. Do you do you ever hear that type of thinking? And what how do you how do you address that? I, I probably it's the number one question that I get, especially from Latter Day Saints. And you know, I live in this community. I'll come back from a two week trip to Israel. I'll be in the grocery store, and people will say, like, I just don't understand why you're going over there. It's dangerous. We all know what's going to happen at the end of end of end of times, and you're you're waste you're wasting your time which is really really hard to hear but i i understand it at a certain level because lds eschatology or ideas around the end of times one of those 
beliefs is a pre-millennial belief, right? That the world's going to increasingly get worse and worse and worse. It's going to end in some sort of cataclysmic uh, apocalyptic event likely happening right in Jerusalem, right? And then Jesus is going to come back. Lots of people are going to die uh, in that process, but the righteous will be, will, you know, will be spared. And it's really interesting because we have a complicated uh, uh, eschatological beliefs uh, as Latter-day Saints. We have that right on side of this idea of building Zion and this idea that we are supposed to be preparing the world preparatory to the second coming of Christ, that we're supposed to be establishing um, communities of Zion, places uh, where uh, we are of one heart and one mind, and and not just thinking about that, at least according to Joseph Smith, as as just, you know, churches, right, that are around. Yeah. And and that, that sounds more like a post-millennial idea, which is also prevalent in Christianity, right, that Christians have a have a duty to uh, make the world uh, a better place. That that's that's supposed to be an outcome of of living living you know Christianity. And it's interested in our in our in our faith. We have an actually complicated relationship with both of those things. I think most Latter Day Saints would agree both of those things are true. And so one way to sort of think about it is that there's there's this one thing that look God does it all and. You know, as long as I'm living righteously, everything will be fine. I think there's other people that go to the other extreme and say, I have to do it all. And God doesn't really get involved in these sorts of sorts of matters uh, at all. Right. And so there's this human approach and there's this God approach. And, you know, when you look at one of the great peacemaking stories, peace building stories in the in the scriptures, which is in the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price with, with Enoch, you see this other approach that God introduces to Enoch when he calls Enoch to go and and to build Zion Enoch's response is I'm 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 but a lad I'm slow of speech everybody hates me what have you and then God in the series of conversations with Enoch says open your mouth I'll fill it go say this I will I will pierce their hearts go to this mountain and say remove this mountain and I will remove it and there's this human divine partnership that says I can't do it all uh, but God also does his work on this earth, you know, through through us. I mean, that's primarily how this is done. And so when I think about something like the conflict in the Middle East, I don't know, and I'm not sure anybody knows exactly. I, I mean, maybe some people claim they do exactly how this is all going to turn out or or when. And so what I can really rely on and my response to that is I have to rely on my own discipleship at this point and what Jesus is telling me. And, and I don't see anywhere in the scriptures where it's just wait around, make sure you're saying your prayers and let me take care, let, let me take care of anything. And in fact, we know from the book of John that that was partly an apostolic response to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is to go back fishing, right? And say, okay, look, our, our salvation has been made sure uh, Jesus is, is resurrected. That was an awesome three years that we spent together. And now we can go back fishing to only have Jesus show back up on the, on the seashore and essentially ask them, do you love these fish more than you love uh, me? And it's so interesting because that's the start of Christianity. I mean, that's really the start of the movement of Christianity is at that moment when those apostles uh, drop their nets for a second time and dedicate their lives uh, to making the, the the world a better place. And so I think about this all the time because the individuals that I work with, the people that are able to experience peace, not only is there a day-to-day -day benefit of not being in conflict every day, not only is there an economic and family benefit from living in communities where we are more collaborative, but there's a spiritual element that comes from feeling a sense of peace instead of a sense of fear that, again, if these are God's children, if these are my brothers and sisters, everyone, we would hope, has that opportunity to feel. So, again, I don't know exactly what's going to happen at the end of, end of days and when that's going to happen, but I know that any individual that I work with that can start to experience some peace, that can start to turn destructive conflict into constructive conflict— that is something that I, I I believe is blessed. And I have felt the spirit in so many occasions 
working with them around this idea that wherever we're working with our brothers and sisters to try to create understanding, to try to try to create love, to follow that that second great commandment of loving our neighbors ourself, we can expect the presence uh, of God to to be there. And, and so it's really interesting to me. We did actually research about this, and uh, Boyd Timothy, a psychology professor, and I published uh, a paper thinking about LDS eschatological attitudes, and we were interested in one aspect of this. If I believe it's all up to God, am I likely to go out and try to make peace in the world, as opposed to if I believe that I have some sort of responsibility or co-participation? And the evidence was was clear from the research that people that just believed in that apocalyptic ending also felt no responsibility to really make the world a better place. At, at that point, I just need to take care of my family. I need to take care of myself. Uh, and and that's, that's all that really matters. But people that saw that, and, and saw that in the scriptures or saw that in their faith, um, were likely to be motivated uh, to go out in their communities and, and make a difference. And so um, what that's a long way of saying that, you know, my my response to that is that it's A, it's complicated. B, there's nothing in the scriptures that says we're just supposed to be waiting around and, and doing nothing. And, and C, even if the end goal is exactly as they describe in that sort of premillennialist apocalyptic goal, there are lives to be lived every day. There are lives to be touched every day. There are people who can experience peace now. And and we also don't know the time or the date of when that's going to be. So sitting around and saying, I'll let Jesus come and fix this, I don't think prepares us for, for the kingdom of, kingdom of God, where God is going to be looking for people who are actively applying this already to their lives. Yeah, love that. Thank you so much for your work and for this conversation. Really appreciate it so much. Is there anything else yeah. that you want to make sure you get to say before we close out? You know, hopefully the spirit of this podcast is intended. It's not meant to minimize the structural uh, and and violence that's happening. It's not meant to, 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 to prescribe to an Israeli or Palestinian that they shouldn't be angry or that they should just go out and play basketball or, or, or you know, make friends with, with someone from the other side. But We've learned that hate begets hate, that violence begets violence, that dehumanization begets de dehumanization. If we really want the sort of peace and justice and, and structures in our world and our society, if we really want that place of one heart and one mind where there are no poor among us, right? If we really want that that place that's described in First Nephi, right, where there are no, no ites among, among us, we have to pursue the a holy path to get there. Martin Luther King talked about that, right? Darkness will not beget um, darkness. And, and so I'm as deeply interested in not just the, the family relationships and personal relationships of Israelis and Palestinians. I'm also deeply relations, interested in the structural violence that they face. Of the of the suffering that they have every day, but I believe, and this is just my belief, and and some of it comes from my faith that there is a path to reconciliation and restoration. There is a path to get there, and it will not be through hatred. It will not be through violence. It will not be through shunning or throwing stones or dehumanizing um, other people. It will look the same way that Jesus offered all of us to, to get out of that hate and enmity so that we, because enmity to me is the, is the enemy of peace. And so wherever we start in that process for us, wherever that looks like in our own lives, being willing to show up and have the courage to do it is, is peace building and peacemaking. And uh, I hope our listeners will take whatever inspiration they feel from this, uh, whether it's about this conflict or a family conflict or, you know, whatever it is, and, and take those first steps. Yeah. Thanks so Thank much, you Jeff. so much. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Chad Ford. If Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.